स्वयं प्रभा डिजिटल इंडिया एजुकेटेड इंडिया Let's now solve a few problems on the singularities of a holomorphic function. The first problem is on removable singularities. So let me note the problem down for you. Let f be a function which is holomorphic on a punctured neighborhood of uh, a point R. So basically, removing the point z0 let it be holomorphic there basically z0 is an isolated uh, singularity be a holomorphic function which satisfies the condition such that the imaginary part of f of z is greater than 0 suppose for all z in the punctured disk dz0 r minus z0 we have the imaginary part of f of z is greater than 0 then prove that Z0 is a removable singularity. Let us give a solution. Uh, the problem will be solved by an application of the Riemann removable singularity theorem in some sense. However, imaginary part of z greater than 0 which is the upper half uh, plane is not a bounded function necessarily and therefore the Riemann removable singularity theorem cannot be used in the exact form that is available to us. So, rather what we will use uh, is that we know there is a map from the upper half space into the unit disk which we have referred to once earlier. Consider the following map, consider the function the Mobius transformation P of z which is given by z minus i by z plus i. So, if you notice this Mobius transformation is holomorphic away from minus i in particular in the uh, in the set of all z such that imaginary part of z is greater than 0 where minus i does not belong to this function is holomorphic and we know that it can be inverted there the function is holomorphic with inverse given by uh, phi inverse of z which is i times 1 plus z by 1 minus z. So, I know the uh, inverse explicitly. So, it is your job to sit down and check that phi inverse indeed is the inverse of phi that is written here. An exercise for you to sit down and check would be that uh, phi maps the upper half space onto the unit disk. So, the easier way to check this exercise would be that phi indeed maps h into the unit disk and that it maps d into the upper half space. Right. So, uh, once we have this let us now get back to our problem. What is the problem telling us? The problem is telling us that uh, the imaginary part of f of z. So, what was h here by the way where h the upper half space is the set of all z in C where the imaginary part of z is greater than 0 and d is the unit disk. Now, getting back to our problem the imaginary part of f of z is greater than 0 for all z in d z 0 r minus z 0. So, that means that f is a map from d z 0 r minus z0 into h right and by composing it with phi hence by composition with phi we have phi composed with f is now a map from d z0 r minus z0 into the unit disk. Now, how situation to apply the Riemann removable singularity theorem. 
the reason being that uh, disk is the set of all z such that mod z is less than 1. So, in particular, P composed with f has an isolated singularity and it is bounded in a neighborhood of z0. By Riemann removable singularity theorem, there exists a function g holomorphic on d z0 r such that p composed with f of z is equal to g of z on d z0 r minus z0. Now, uh, the key thing is that g is going to map d z0 r into the set of all z such that mod z is less than or equal to 1, right? By the open mapping theorem, by applying the open mapping theorem, notice that open mapping theorem is necessary to ensure that G of Z0 is not having uh, unit modulus. By open mapping theorem, uh, G of Z0 is going to be in the unit disk, G is going to be a map from D Z0 R into the unit disk. That is good because now if you compose with p inverse by composing with p inverse which is a map from d to h this composition makes sense. So, we have f of z is equal to p inverse composed with g of z on d z0 r minus z0 and p inverse composed with G is holomorphic on dz0 r and therefore, which tells us that z0 is a removable singularity by the very definition of removable singularity. Removable singularity of f. The next problem is uh, about the behavior of a holomorphic function around a pole. If you recall the definition of a pole, uh, Z0 is a pole when as we approach Z0, the limit of the absolute value goes up. The limit as Z goes to Z0 of absolute value of f of Z is infinite. In this problem, what we will do is that we will show that uh, the image of uh, d Z0 uh, r minus Z0 will contain the complement of uh, uh, a disk of some radius. So, it's a, it's a much stronger property than the definition, isn't it? So, let me write down the problem so that it will be clearer. Let z0 be a pole of a function f which is defined on d z0 r minus z0 into c. Then prove that there exists some capital R greater than 0 such that the set of all z in C with mod z greater than R is contained in f of d z0 R minus z0. Let us try to prove this problem. If you go back and check the behavior of a uh, pole, so suppose our z0 is a pole of order m, okay, let z0 be a pole of order m. We may assume without loss of generality that on d z0 r minus z0 f does not vanish. Let us assume that f of z is not equal to 0 on d z0 r minus z0. This can be certainly assumed because after all if you shrink it a bit, it, uh, the, the fact that the absolute value of f of z blows up exactly means that for some smaller, in some smaller disk it is greater than some capital M. So, this can certainly be uh, assumed and because it is a pole of order M, then there exists some function g which is now having a removable singularity 
which hence will be defined on dz0r into c with g of z not equal to 0 on dz0r such that on dz0r minus z0 we have our function f of z is equal to g of z by z minus z0 to the power n. This is precisely the definition of a pole of order n. So, g is not going to vanish over there. And uh, let us now define the function h to be let uh, h be the function 1 by f of z. Now that is going to be equal to z minus z0 to the power m times g of z. So, let me just call h to be equal to uh, h1 to be equal to 1 by f of z on dz0 r minus z0. And immediately we know from our theory that we have developed that h1 has a removable singularity. at z0 and further and that h1 of z0 is equal to 0. So, this is something which we will certainly h maybe I should not uh, write h of z0 is equal to 0 where h extends let me just put it this way h extends h0. If h0 has a removable singularity at z0 that means that in d z0 r there is a holomorphic function h such that h of z is equal to h1 of z on dz0 r minus z0. So, I have just captured all that by saying that h extends h0 maybe I should just add dz to dz0 to, to r. So, now we have a function h here which is defined and holomorphic on dz0 r and which maps z0 to 0. Now, again let me use the open mapping theorem. Let us just see how powerful the open mapping theorem is. By the open mapping theorem, And the fact that uh, h is not uh, identically a constant function, since h is not a constant, h of z0 is going to be an interior point. That means there exists epsilon positive such that d 0 epsilon is contained in f of d z0 r. Right? That means that not f h. It means that any point in the uh, disk of radius epsilon around 0 is in the image of d z 0 r under h because of the open mapping theorem. Remember that h is defined on d z 0 r. In fact, uh, we can say a little more if w uh, now be in C such that mod w or other uh, mod w is greater than 1 by epsilon. Let me call this 1 by epsilon to be capital R. Suppose this is the case, this would imply that 1 by w belongs to d 0 epsilon, right. 1 by w will now have uh, in particular w is not 0, remember that. So, 1 by w is going to be in d 0 epsilon and since w is not equal to 0, Remember that h maps only 0 uh, z0 to 0 and therefore w there exists some z in d z0 r minus z0 such that 1 by w is equal to h of z. But now let us go back to the definition. What was our h? h was basically uh, away from d z0 r uh, away from z0 this is nothing but h1 of z and what was h1 of z? h1 of z is just 1 by f of z, right. So, this is going to be equal to 1 by f of z. This implies that f of z is equal to w. So, that means you take any arbitrary point w in C which satisfies the condition that mod w is greater than r. Hence, the set of all uh, w such that mod w is greater than r is contained in f of d z 0 uh, r minus the isolated singularity. 
and that is precisely what we had set out to prove. If I go up and show you the problem, that is precisely what we were asked to prove. Let us now consider another problem where our singularity has certain specific behavior. So, let f from d z 0 r minus z 0 into c be a holomorphic function. That means that it has an isolated singularity at z 0 such that the real part of f of z is less than some r for some real number r. And for all z in d z 0 r minus z 0. So, the real part is bounded above on the punctured disk of uh, radius r. If this happens even then uh, f has a removable singularity. at z0. Let us try to give a proof of this. So, basically the condition that we are given is that the real part of f of z is bounded on d z0 r minus z0. So, what are the type of singularities that can happen? f can either have a removable singularity or it can have a pole or it can have an essential singularity. One of these three should necessarily happen. We will show that uh, f cannot have a pole or that it cannot have an essential singularity. We will come to a contradiction in either cases. Suppose z0 is a pole. Of, of f. Then what will happen? Then by our previous problem, we know that there is some capital R, so uh, the, maybe the R should not be confused, there is some R fixed here, maybe I should change it to M, yeah, maybe let me change it to N so that I can work freely with R's. So, by the previous problem, if Z0 is a pole, there exists some capital R greater than 0 such that the set of all uh, z with mod z greater than r is contained in f of d z 0 r minus z 0. This is something which we have ensured. Now, let us pick some point let w uh, be a point in C which has the properties mod w greater than r and such that the real part of w is greater than m. This can certainly be arranged. You can get hold of one w which satisfies the condition which we do not want here. Right? Now, what will happen here? By the condition star, we will be able to get hold of some free image of uh, w in d z 0 r minus z 0. There exists z in uh, d z 0 r minus z 0 by star such that uh, f of z is equal to w. And that would imply that the real part of f of z is equal to the real part of w which is greater than m for z in d z 0 r minus z 0 which is a contradiction which is a contradiction. Because if you go up and uh, check the hypothesis in the problem, we have put the restriction that for every z in d z 0 r minus z 0, our real part of f of z is less than m. And we just ensured that uh, this is going to happen, this is going to be violated. And therefore, we have ruled out the possibility that z 0 is a pole and z 0 cannot be a pole. So, the contradiction came up because we assumed that z 0 is a pole. Let us now rule out the possibility that z0 is an essential singularity. Suppose z0 is an essential singularity. Let us come to some kind of a contradiction. Here we are going to use the Cassorati waste stress theorem. 
what did Cassaretti weigh stress theorem tell us? By the Cassaretti weigh stress theorem, f of b z0 r minus z0 is dense in C. That is what it said, right? For every uh, alpha in C, there exists some sequence Zn. Let me recall the statement for you. Given uh, W in C, there exists a sequence Zn converging to Z0, a sequence converging to the singularity such that f of Zn converges to W. In fact, we this is a stronger statement than demanding that b z0 r minus z0 is dense. In fact, we the exact statement would be equivalent to this would be for any epsilon positive where epsilon is less than r, then f of d z0 epsilon minus z0 is dense in C. That will be the equivalent of whatever is written inside the bracket here. But anyway, we have in d z0 r minus z0 a sequence which converges to w where w is again going to be picked as above. Let w be a, a point in the complex plane such that the real part of w is greater than m. Again a condition which was which is going to give us the contradiction and let zn be a sequence by the Cassaretti Weierstrass theorem uh, in d z0 r minus z0 such that zn converges to z0 and f of zn converges to w. This is ensured by the Cassaretti Weierstrass theorem. This tells us that the there exists some capital N by the very definition of convergence. When f of zn converges to w, the real part of f of zn converges to the real part of w and therefore there is some n such that for all n greater than capital N, we have the real part of f of zn is greater than m because the real part of w is greater than m. So, the uh, convergence ensures that this happens which is again a contradiction because now we have found a, a sequence in fact of points, in fact a sequence of points zn such that uh, the real part of f of zn ha is going to be greater than m and therefore z0 cannot be an essential singularity. So of the three possible isolated singularities that are possible, we have ruled out pole and an essential singularity and therefore this is forced to be uh, remove the singularity. So, the next problem is going to deal with how the behavior of an isolated singularity changes when we exponentiate a given function which has an isolated singularity. Let me write down the problem and then we will see a proof of it, a solution to it rather. Let f be, let z0 be an isolated singularity of a function f. That means that f is holomorphic on d z0 r minus z0. I'm not talking about the type of isolated singularity. The problem here is to show that then the function e to the power f, which is the composition of the exponentiation with the function f, uh, does not have a pole at z0. Notice that uh, z0 is still an isolated singularity of e to the power f because this is a function which is still defined on dz0 r minus z0. However, we can now for sure say that it cannot have a pole at z0. It will either be a removable singularity or it will be an essential singularity. That is the essence of the problem. In fact, we will prove exactly what happens when z0 is a removable singularity and what will happen when z0 is uh, a pole and when z0 is an essential singularity of small f. Let us consider all these cases separately. Suppose we have z0 as a removable singularity, let z0 be a removable singularity. This is the simplest case i.e. 
their x's g in d z0 are holomorphic such that uh, f of z is equal to g of z on d z0 r minus z0 where d z0 r minus z0 is where our function f is defined we do not know its behavior at z0 suppose it is a removable singularity we can get hold of one such function g that would imply that e to the power f of z is equal to e to the power g of z for all uh, z in this particular set. But then e to the power g of z is a holomorphic function on d z0 r because exponential, exponential is a entire function and g is a function which is defined on d z0 r which means that uh, e to the power f has a removable singularity. At z0. So, if z0 is a removable singularity of f, then z0 is necessarily a removable singularity of e to the power f as well. Now, let us consider the case when z0 is a pole. Let z0 be a pole of f. Let us now show that z0 cannot be a removable singularity or a pole of e to the power f. In fact, we will come to a con contradiction if z0 is either a removable singularity or a pole of e to the power f. Let us assume, suppose z0 is a removable singularity of e to the power f. Remember that e to the power f is just composition of exponential, exponential function with the function small f. And suppose z0 is uh, a removable singularity, what does that mean? That means that uh, the absolute value of e to the power f of z, this is less than some number m for by going down to a smaller neighbor if smaller neighborhood if needed by continuity we do have this. I will just call the same r as the uh, radius of uh, the disk concerned. So, we will have that e to the power uh, f of z having absolute has absolute value less than m here. But what is the absolute value of e to the power w for some w which is equal to a to the power I, a plus i b that is going to be equal to e to the power a which is basically e to the power real part of w right. So, this means that e to the power real part of f of z this is going to be less than m. Now, these are some real numbers and uh, by taking the logarithm we get to conclude that real part of f of z. So, remember that m is some positive number here. So, this is going to be less than some m prime for all z in d z 0 r minus z naught. But by the previous problem what did we uh, conclude if the real part of f of z is less than m prime. This uh, helps us conclude that f has a removable singularity at z0, is not it? But if you go up and check, we assumed that z0 is a pole of f. So, if z0 is a removable singularity of e to the power f, we ended up concluding that z0 is also a removable singularity of f, which is a contradiction. So, in particular, if z0 is a pole of uh, uh, z, if, if z0 is a pole of f, then z0 cannot be a removable singularity of e to the power f. Now, what if uh, z0 is a pole of e to the power f? That would mean that e to the power minus f has a removable singularity at z0, is not it? That is by the very definition. In fact, at z0 e to the power minus f is going to be 0. If z0 is a pole of e to the power f, 1 by e to the power f will have a 0 at z0 after removing the singularity. It is going to be a removable singularity. But then if z0 is a removable singularity of e to the power f, we concluded that f has a removable singularity at z0, right? And using this argument, 
by the argument above we have z0 is a removable singularity of minus f but then that would imply that z0 is a removable singularity of f as well if z0 is a removable singularity of minus f then z0 is going to be a removable singularity of f as well but that is going to be a contradiction to the assumption that uh, z0 is a pole right we started off again with the assumption that z0 is a pole. so hence if z0 happens to be a pole of f then both the cases of z0 being a removable singularity of e to the power f or z0 being a pole of e to the power f are ruled out and thus z0 is an essential singularity there are only three possibilities for a, for an isolated singularity and that is precisely what we have. So what have let us just go back and see what we have done we have checked the following we have checked that if z0 is a removable singularity then e to the power f has a removable singularity at z0. Then the next uh, conclusion was if z0 is a pole of f then we have z0 is an essential singularity of z0 of uh, z0 is an essential singularity of e to the power f I am sorry and so finally we are only left with one case what happens when z0 is an essential singularity of f so let z0 now be an essential singularity and in this case we are going to use the casuarity Vespers theorem to establish that z0 is going to be an essential singularity of e to the power f as well. The key thing to note is that exponential is a map from the complex plane to c minus 0 and it is a continuous function. So hence uh, by casuarity Vespers theorem Again, let me just write the statement down as e f of d z0 r minus z0. If you look at this function's closure, that is going to be equal to c. Now, being a continuous function, since e or x is continuous, x of f of d z0 r minus z0 bar this is going to be contained in x of f of d of z0 r minus z0 closure and therefore this is basically c so this is going to tell us that c star c minus 0 is contained in this closed set which means that the x of f of d z0 r minus z0 closure is going to be equal to c and that tells us that maybe this step which, la, which I am writing down uh, as a last step is a minute's thought this is going to be an essential singularity. This cannot happen this particular condition cannot happen if uh, z0 is a removable singularity or a pole therefore z is going to be an essential singularity. So we now know exactly how the behavior of an isolated singularity changes when we exponentiate our given function. In the next problem we will discuss uh, the behavior of a function which is holomorphic on a given set omega minus a set s which not necessarily is discrete. We have not uh, really studied singularities which are not isolated. This is uh, however, going to use techniques from casuarity Vestas theorem very crucially and say something about singularities which are not isolated. So, let us this is more of a fun exercise. So, let, let f be a function from omega minus z0, z1, z2, and so on, where omega is open connected and zn is a sequence which converges to z0 in omega. So basically zn and uh, z0 are all points in omega, zn converges to z0. So this is a 
converging sequence along with its limit point. So notice that the thing inside this bracket, this is not a discrete set, Z0 is a limit point. So we have a function which is holomorphic, oh, I didn't write that, let f be a holomorphic function on such a set. Assume further that Zn for n greater than 0, basically Z1, Z2, Z3, all these points are poles of f. Let Z1, Z2, so on be poles of f. Then the statement of Cassarati Weierstrass theorem is true for such a function as well. Then given epsilon positive, the image of d z0 epsilon minus the singularities z1, z2 and so on. f of this is dense in C. So, we are going to mimic the proof of uh, Cassarati Weierstrass theorem here. So, consider uh, complex number alpha, alpha in C such that uh, alpha is not in the closure. So, let me, do I have to write it? Yeah, let me just write it fully. Alpha is not in the closure of D Z0 epsilon minus Z0, Z1 and so on. This is a closed set and alpha is in the complement that implies that there exists some, some delta positive such that d z d alpha delta a intersected with f of uh, d z0 epsilon minus z0 z1 closure is empty. So, let us do the exact same thing that we did earlier, define g of z to be equal to 1 by f of z minus alpha. So, notice that f of z is not going to be equal to alpha ever, in fact f of z does not take values in a neighborhood of alpha and therefore 1 by f of z minus alpha makes sense. This is defined on omega minus z0, z1 and so on. Now, if you focus on mod g of z, this is going to be 1 by f of z minus alpha as absolute value, which is in fact less than 1 by delta. So, this is bounded on this omega minus z0, z1, z2 and so on. Also, if you consider z n for n greater than 0 is an isolated singularity. of f. Now they are a sequence which is converging to z0, they are, they are all isolated singularities of f. So, let me add one uh, criterion here uh, is a sequence of distinct points, otherwise this uh, statement which I just mentioned will not be right. So this is condition is imposed. So, the sequence is going to be distinct and therefore, each of these points is going to be an isolated singularity of f. And what did we just uh, check out? We checked out that g is bounded in a neighborhood of each of these isolated singularities, which tells us that g has a removable singularity at Zn for all n greater than 0, Z0 we will come to at the very end. But what do we know about, uh, about our function f? We know that Zn for every n greater than 0 is a pole of our function, right? Since Zn is a pole of f, what do we have? We have g of Zn is equal to 0. Remember that uh, g of z is 1 by f of z minus alpha. So, as we approach uh, 
the points Zn, the absolute value goes up and therefore 1 by f of Zn minus alpha also will f of 1 by 1 by f of z minus alpha will also converge to 0 as z approaches zn for each n and therefore we have g of zn is going to be equal to 0. So, this tells us that g is now defined on dz0 r minus z0 and hence z0 is a removable singularity. And moreover, if you just go up and check, we have this condition here and on each of the points z and g of z n is equal to 0, again g is locally bounded which tells us in the z0 minus r which tells us that g has a removable singularity and has a removable singularity because it is bounded in a neighborhood of z0. Which tells us that uh, if you can extend past uh, z0 as well, but we know that each of the zn's are 0 and g of as zn converges to z0, g of zn because of continuity by continuity g of z0 is equal to 0 by continuity. But now we are facing a contradiction namely that we have a function g which is not identically equal to 0 and such that its 0 set has a limit point. Now notice that g is a non-zero function such that g of zn is equal to 0 for all n greater than or equal to 0 and such that and such that we set z0, z1 so on has a limit point. That is a contradiction to the identity theorem or the statement that the zeros of a holomorphic, non-zero holomorphic function are discrete, are isolated. This is a contradiction. Let me just write that it is a contradiction to the identity theorem. Notice how strongly all these theorems are being used. So, all this happened because we considered some alpha which satisfied this condition which we hence conclude that uh, cannot happen. Hence, there does not exist such an alpha. That means that the image is going to be hence. Okay, let me conclude this problem session by trying to compute the Laurent series expansion of a particular function on different analyte. So, the problem is the following. Consider the following rational function. Consider f of z given by 1 by z times z minus 1. This is a function which is holomorphic away from the origin and the point 1. So, it has isolated singularities at 0 and 1. Prove that or find rather find the Laurent series expansion of f around okay in the following analyte in the following analyte. Let us work it out separately. Anuli is the plural for annulus. The first one is on d01 minus 0. Notice that on d01 minus 0 this function is holomorphic. How about on d11 minus 1? So, this is the disk of radius 1 around 1 with 1 the point 1 removed. And finally, the annulus which is the set of all z's is that mod z is greater than 1. Notice that in the case c as well this function this particular function is holomorphic. Notice that these are all annuli and in each of these annuli our function is holomorphic and therefore we can talk about a Laurent series expansion in each of these uh, 
uh, annuli. Let us start with the first one. D on D0 on D01. What do we know about 1 by z minus 1? We know that this is basically 1 by 1 minus z and for mod z less than 1, we know that this has the series expansion summation z to the power n where n is going to go from 0 to infinity. So, this power series expansion exists. Then for z not equal to 0, 1 by z times uh, the power series, this is going to be equal to by taking it in because this series is convergent, we can always do that, but we can always, we can do this in this case, this is going to be z to the power n minus 1 where n is going from 0 to infinity and this is precisely our z times z minus 1 and we have our power series expansion here. So, this is exactly equal to 1 by z plus summation z to the power n, n going from 0 to infinity. So, that is going to be the Laurent series expansion of 1 by z times z minus 1 on the so this is true, this is true for every z on d0, 1, minus 0 and that is the reason why by the uniqueness of uh, coefficients we get to conclude that this is the Laurent series expansion. How about when we focus our attention on d11, the techniques are not going to be very different then on d11 what is going to be 1 by z, we will just rewrite this as 1 by 1 minus 1 minus z. Now on d11, 1 minus z will have absolute value less than 1. Again, we can talk about the power series expansion here. This is going to be 1 minus z to the power n, where n is going to go from 0 to infinity. So that is going to be 1 by z on d11. Because this uh, series converges absolutely, for z not equal to 1, what is going to be 1 by z minus 1 times z? That is going to be equal to 1 by z minus 1 times this series which is going to be equal to minus of summation n is equal to 0 to infinity 1 minus z to the power n minus 1. Yet again we can write the expansion similarly as above. So, that this is going to be the Laurent series expansion around uh, 1 in a punctured disk of radius 1. Now, that is the case with annuli which are having different uh, centers. So, this is an analysis which is centered at 0, this is an analysis which is centered at 1. But this analysis and this analysis both are centered at 0 if you notice. This is actually nothing but a 0 uh, 1 infinity right. This is the analysis which has r 1 equal to 1 and r 2 infinite. So, what happens in C? Let us now get to what happens in C. Let us again do some manipulations and see what happens. Notice that z is satisfying the condition that mod z is greater than 1 right on uh, the set of all z such that mod z is greater than 1. What do we have? We have we have 1 by z minus 1 times z, this is just going to be equal to 1 by z square times 1 minus 1 by z. This is exactly what our series is going to behave like. Now, mod z greater than 1 implies that 1 by z has absolute value less than 1. Therefore, I can write 1 by 1 minus z in the following power series. This is going to be 1 by z to the power n where n goes from 0 to infinity and that is going to be equal to n equal to now uh, 0 to infinity of 1 by z to the power n plus 2 or this is equal to summation n is equal to 2 to infinity z to the power minus n. So, notice that uh, on two different annuli centered at 0, we have distinct Laurent series expansion, they are not similar. However, once we fix uh, an annuli, we get to have a very unique power series.